Good day, everybody. This is Jim Sloman speaking. There are any number of things that we could comment on. However, I would like to comment today on the larger picture of what is happening now to put things in a little perspective. And to do that, we should look at a little history. What's happening is that central banks around the world, but especially the Federal Reserve Bank in the US, have become very adept at blowing bubbles through money creation and its concomitant credit and debt creation. In the US, though the depreciation of the currency began shortly after the Fed was created in 1913 and accelerated somewhat after the US went off the gold standard domestically in 1934 and internationally in 1971, the process of serially blowing bubbles began in 1987. When faced with the stock market crash of 87, the Fed drastically lowered interest rates and managed to reflate the economy and the markets so that the economy did not have the recession that it otherwise would have had, which would have corrected previous excesses. The same thing happened in 1991. Because of a recession that threatened to get worse, the Fed again lowered interest rates and kept them low. This resulted, over the next eight years, in a gigantic tech bubble. Now, the thing about financial bubbles is that if you allow them to form, they do burst sooner or later. They reach a point where they're so overpriced that they burst of their own accord. And when they do burst, bubbles cause a tremendous amount of destruction to an economy. Cleaning up in the aftermath of a large burst bubble is very difficult, messy, and painful. So the thing to do is not to blow them in the first place. Once you've allowed a bubble to form, it's going to burst, and then there will be devastation. So the thing to do is not to allow a bubble to form, because it is much easier to prevent a bubble than it is to deal with the aftermath after it has burst. But the Fed doesn't do that. It blows these large bubbles, each one larger than the last, and then absolves itself from any responsibility when the bubble bursts, saying that there is no way to recognize a bubble until after the fact, after it has already burst. That's nonsense, of course. You can recognize a bubble when it is forming and then growing. In 1999, for instance, the US NASDAQ was at an astronomical 65 times earnings. It doesn't take a financial genius to recognize that long before that, you were already in bubble territory. The Fed has great power to take away the punch bowl before everybody at the party gets completely drunk. It can raise interest rates while the bubble is still forming, or it can use other policy initiatives, such as raising reserve requirements for banks, or the reserve requirements for purchase of stocks or houses, etc. Instead, the Fed appears to prefer to let the bubble form and then burst and then try to clean up afterwards, which, in my humble opinion, is not a great idea. Similar to the tech bubble, after the Fed blew another bubble, the housing bubble of 2004, 5, 6, and 7, the relationship between housing prices and household income became untethered to reality. The relationship between housing and income blew up to three times what it had historically been for many decades. Perhaps the man in the street was fooled, but the many economists at the Fed should have realized what was going on. It didn't take an advanced degree to realize that housing was in an extreme bubble. Now the thing is, when a bubble bursts, not only do you lose the value gained on the upside, you lose all that and more because the bubble almost invariably, because of gathering velocity, goes below what fair value is. So the society winds up losing all it has gained from the bubble and then some. And I'd like to show you an example of that. Uh, here's the South Sea bubble that took place in the early 1720s. And you'll notice that here's where the acceleration started, which is where uh, you basically count the start of a bubble. And notice that after the bubble had formed and then burst, that it then went below the point 
where the acceleration had started from. And here's another example. And this is just two out of many I could show. Uh, this is the stock market in the Dow Jones from 1920 to 1936. And here's where the actual acceleration started, right in here, uh, around the beginning of 1927. And notice that after the bubble reached its peak and then burst, it then went to a point below where the acceleration had started. And this is typical of uh, bubbles. Once they have formed and then burst, they go below the point where they formed in the first place. So where are we now? Right now the Fed is once more blowing another bubble and true to form with each bubble being larger than the last, this one will be the biggest of all. The QE2 along with what's known as QE Lite is about 110 billion a month of new money. This will add some 900 billion of new money in the next eight months on top of the 1.3 trillion of new money already created in QE1 in the last couple of years. To see the effects of QE1, pay no attention to the manipulated official inflation figures and just look around you at prices. They are rising relentlessly everywhere from the supermarket to the gas station to commodities. The standard commodity index has risen 35% over the last year. Think about that, 35%. The same thing is happening in the emerging countries. China, India, Brazil, Russia, and many others are all experiencing increasing real inflation and negative real interest rates. Central banks have been stepping on the gas everywhere. Of course, they encounter resistance in doing this from time to time. But this is also par for the course. Great inflations do not proceed in a smooth fashion. All great inflations in history have been born in recession and depression by a government heavily in debt, and the monetary creation, which is the root cause of inflation, always proceeds in a rather herky-jerky, stop-and-go fashion. But back to the U.S., because of various causes from the financial decline of U.S. states and cities, to the enormous burst housing bubble, which has destroyed some 17 trillion of wealth, to the scarred, scared, and tapped out consumer, to the very high unemployment, which is reducing consumer demand. The economy in 2011 will likely be in further decline. However, because of paralyzed fiscal policy at the national level, the Fed will be forced to respond with QE3 and QE4 and QE5 and so on. In fact, this will eventually be demanded as prices keep rising and both consumer and corporate budgets get more and more squeezed. The likely further decline of the economy in 2011 will not necessarily prevent the stock market and other markets from going up. Most of the money that the Fed creates finds its way to the banks and other financial entities and from there to the asset markets. While the asset markets are getting more and more overvalued and are subject to sudden shocks because of that, nevertheless, the tidal wave of money pouring into the system will most likely continue to lift them overall for a while yet, until the time comes when this latest and largest bubble, which will likely mutate into a hyperinflation at some point, finally bursts. When this final bubble bursts, which could occur at almost any time in the next few years, the U.S. and the world will have to give up everything and more that was gained from the blowing of these inadvisable financial bubbles. In closing, I'd like to read you two sayings about gratitude, the first by Meister Eckhart, the great German mystic of the late 13th and early 14th century. If the only prayer you ever said to God in your whole life was thank you, that would suffice. That's all for today. May every possible good fortune be yours. Until we meet again, bye-bye now.